Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming along. For those of you who never knew, and perhaps those who have forgotten, my name is John Moore. I was born in a place called the Half Parish. As historians, of course, you all know it's a parish of Kilmaclasser. And some years ago, when I was studying local history, I was seeking a subject for my thesis. And naturally, I thought of Newport. But I found that two of your members had already done the groundwork there, Peter and Mr. Joe McDermott. They had written very scholarly theses on the town, and I felt there was no room for me there. But then I noticed that there was a recurring theme. People referred to the difficulties of financial difficulties of Mr. Pratt. And I thought, I must investigate that. Financial difficulties are something we all know about. And it was topical at the time. Banks were going belly up and so on. And I began to concentrate on Mr. Pratt, Mr. Medlicott, and James Moore. And uh, my studies took me back to 1701. Now, I'll just tell you, there are three people significant in the foundation of this town. Well, two were important, and one developed further on. Thomas Medlicott and John Pratt. Now these two, I have a certain sympathy for John Pratt. He was a most unfortunate man. I'll tell you more about him later. The Thomas Medlicott was a, an Englishman. He had an estate in Binfield in Berkshire. He had been a member of the British House of Commons. He was a lawyer. He had worked for the Ormond estate in Munster. And he did a lot of fancy footwork in the troubles around 1690 to 19 to 1690 to 1701 with the transition there and he found favor he was made a revenue commissioner in the revenue service of ireland and came to work in dublin he had acquired an estate the brazil estate here 75 70 000 no one was too sure of the extent, 75,000 acres. Of that. But in my opinion, he didn't know what to do with it. There's no evidence that he ever came here to see it, <coughs> but he acquired it from the Earl of Ormond on a 999 year lease at 400 pounds per year, which at that time, I suppose, would seem to be a bargain. But he had a problem. He didn't have an agent, he didn't have a steward. So in 1714 or thereabouts, he employed a man called George Harrison to collect the rent. The rent was 680 from the tenants he had here. He paid 400 to Ormond. He paid 50 to Harrison to collect. So he left 200 pounds. It was what bankers call a non-performing asset. Now George Medlicott, I'm sure, would have liked to rid himself of the estate, but probably there were no takers. And then another man comes on the scene, John Pratt. John Pratt was born in King's Court in County Cavan, Cabra Castle. Now, Cabra Castle is in ruins, but I'm told that the present Cabra Castle is a high, highly regarded hotel. Anyone who's interested in wedding receptions and such like, you'd be well advised to take a into account. He was the fourth son, no hope of inheriting anything. Fourth son, not much hope. He had three choices open to him. He had the army, the church, or, God forbid, he might even have to get involved in trade. He chose the army, he rose to the rank of captain, and he retired early from the army. He became a member of parliament for Bandon in the Irish parliament. Now, that doesn't imply any high degree of popularity in Bandon, because the electorate was very restricted, and uh, he played around with that for a while. Incidentally, the Irish Parliament in College Green met every two years, if necessary. <laughs> and <laughs> it wasn't exactly a tough job. He was also, at different times, he got, one of his jobs was Keeper of Dublin Castle. Uh, for which he got £365 a year for a life, whatever that meant. But he had a 
his lucky day, he became Deputy Vice Treasurer and Paymaster General of Ireland. Lovely title, but it had certain advantages. The Revenue Commissioners, as they do today, and they were a very efficient organisation 200 years ago, they collected the taxes. They collected customs and excise. Customs on imported goods, excise on home produced. And they handed the money over to the Deputy Vice Treasurer to keep it. And the Deputy Vice Treasurer could do what he liked with the money, provided it was available when required. That's important. Could invest in any way he liked, provided it was available. And um, Medlicott, uh, from what I saw in the minute books of the <coughs> Revenue Commissioners in their queue in London, a very interesting read if you want to have a look at them, and um, there was a fear among the Revenue Commissioners that all wasn't well in the office of the Deputy Vice Treasurer. There were constant reminders to the staff, please ensure a receipt is obtained. Kindly get an acknowledgement for this. It's very important to, to have an acknowledgement. There was a distrust, a feeling that all wasn't well in the office of the Deputy Vice Treasurer. In fact, in a obituary many years later, it was said that John Pratt was probably the worst Deputy Vice Treasurer ever. <laughs> Which is not something obituary, but that was how it was. All wasn't well. So bear that in mind. Um, anyway, Pratt, Medlicott and Pratt got together. Pratt had money to invest, and Medlicott didn't have any. Medlicott uh, had a habit of running out of money. John Medlic uh, Thomas Medlicott was getting a thousand a year from his job in Dublin. A thousand a year in 1713. It was substantial. He had an estate in Benfield and Berkshire as well which was supposed to provide an income from. But he didn't seem to have money to invest in his Brazil estate. He collected, as I said, 280 or 300 pounds a year from it. No evidence that he ever bothered to come here. And um, he got together with Mr. <coughs> Pratt. Pratt had money. <coughs> and he convinced Pratt to lease the estate from him for the... Um, unexpired portion of the 999-year lease. So it was still about 980 years. And it was a fee farm grant. I had it up there before, I hope I can <coughs> cover it again. Not that it's very easy to read. In fact, it took me six weeks to decipher it in the um, office in Dublin. And it was a fee farm grant, which was Better than a lease, but not quite as good as fee simple. And it starts off, if I bear with you, so see if I can revive this thing. There it is. This indenture made. I'll read here. It goes like this. This indenture made the second day of April in the sixth year of the reign of our Lord. George, by the grace of God, King, Defender of the Faith, and in the year of our Lord, 1720. That's, that's your target to aim at for celebrating. Between the noble <coughs> Thomas Medlicott of the City of Dublin, in the Kingdom of Ireland, Esquire, one of the commissioners of His Majesty's Revenue of the one part, and John Pratt of the said City, Esquire of the other part. And I guarantee you, even if that's the best the, uh, the uh, library can produce for me. And you may say it's not in focus, but it's practically impossible to get it sharper than that. And in this deed, Mr. Medlicott ceded to John Pratt the 75,000 acres of the Brazil estate and for a rent of 500 pounds per year, plus the 400 pound to the Ormond estate, and that was for the first five years. And I imagine that was to enable him to get on his feet. And the rent was to increase at various stages up to 1400, and it was continuing like that for 77 years. 
but the deed itself, as I read it, I began to wonder what sort of a fool Pratt was. He was being taken advantage of. I think if I was there, I would have said, you know, for God's sake, don't sign. There are things in this that I don't like. The usual conditions as to rent and where the rent should be paid, that was there. Also, there was a condition that Pratt would build within 13 years 20 houses near Ballybottom Bridge on both sides of the river or at some convenient place. These are the words. And each house was to be built of stone with a mortar of lime and sand. And the roof was to be of slate. And each house was to have a loft. And as well as that, it was to have a garden and a gate to each house. We were in one of the houses, but Medlicott Street was the first street built in this town. Each garden was to have a fruit tree planted in it. Now, if I am buying 50 acres of land, and somebody says, you have to build, you have to build four houses on it, I said, it's none of your business, I'm buying it. So I, I'm wondering what, what Pratt was being misled. There were various other conditions. He had to divide the Brazil estate into 40 or 50 farms. He had to set the boundaries. He had to plant trees in these farms because it was a requirement of the Irish Parliament. They were trying to go through a period of reforestation because the British Navy had got rid of all the trees in the previous century and the reforestation didn't actually work, but it was put in the deed. And he had to plant sallies in the bogs or spend 500 pounds on improvements. It's so detailed what he had to do. This, as I say, if you go across the river and allow for amalgamations here in this building and in what used to be Joyce's garage and Behili's garage down there, you can make out that there were 20 houses. The 20 houses specified by Medlicott in the handover deed. Now there were other things in it. He had to um, grind corn in the mills in Brazil. I didn't know there were mills, but that's <coughs> He had various other, but nobody, I wouldn't, and I know nothing about anything, I would, I would have said, don't sign, God's sake, you have, to, you have to build the town. But I believe there was method in, in Medlicott's idea. There were two ways of looking at it. One, because of his suspicions that all wasn't well in the office, <coughs> of, of in Pratt's office, that it would, Pratt would eventually be in trouble and he would get back his estate with 20 houses <laughs> and the farms all divided up nicely and tenants in it. That was one interpretation of it. Another way of looking at it was that it was a stroke. There was a condition in there that it wasn't written. Because four years after the deed was signed, a miracle happened. The Revenue Service established in Newport the headquarters for the Mayo District. And it provided tenants for the 20 houses. But that wasn't mentioned in the deed. So strokes like we had in the, in the 20th century didn't start in the 20th century. They, they were there from the beginning. Anyway, four years. At this stage, Mr. Medlicott was the chief revenue commissioner. Who was to stop him, as I say? And the revenue came to Newport. It had already been in Foxford, which is a logical place, very illogical for an organization that looks after the customs, especially imports, into the town. The situation proceeded, the houses were built, and then there was an audit of Mr. Pratt's affairs. And there was a discrepancy <coughs> between 75 and 100,000. Now we're talking about 300 years ago, the discrepancy in the books. The Public Accounts Committee, and they existed, they exist today in all areas, they existed then, the Public Accounts Committee started investigating. Various people ran for shelter, naming somebody else, as happens when there's discrepancy found anywhere. 
the English um, vice treasurers who had overall control of Pratt's office were blamed. They didn't uh, adequately control the thing. Pratt had taken investments from private individuals as well as the government money. But he was astute enough to pay off all his private creditors. Dean Swift entrusted money to him, and Dean Swift was surprised to get it back in the, in the uh, dissolution of Pratt's affairs. But the government didn't get back their money. And as I said before, at 40 years after the event, there was 77,000 still outstanding. I don't know if it was ever paid in <coughs> As I said before, Medlicott Street may still be under mortgage to the British government. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure collected. Anyway, the estate reverted to Medlicott at this stage. And uh, he now had the town. He had over there somewhere, he had the revenue service. He had 20 houses, so things were looking up for him. Pratt had been anxious to get tenants, and he brought in some members of the Society of Friends, Quakers, because they were noted for their sober habits and their punctuality in paying, in paying their debts. In fact, they seldom incurred debts. But the Quaker enterprise didn't work in the sense, number one, it was too small, and number two, making a living from weaving, flax growing, and land didn't seem to be added. But the other thing was, the community was so small, they couldn't find marriage partners for their children. They also campaigned to have a graveyard. I don't know if anybody knows where it is. I couldn't find it, whether a graveyard was allocated especially to them. But they disappeared. They didn't disappear. They moved out. Some of them went to County Down. Some of them went to the Midlands. They had been subsidised for years by <coughs> communities of friends in other parts of the country. Now there's uh, evidence of a rent roll, and it was made out by a man called Hennen or Heenan about. 1725, 29 maybe, in that period. And there's a suggestion that he was one of the, of the uh, Quakers that didn't go. There's also a suggestion that some of, them, some of them stayed and integrated with the local population. And there's at least one person here tonight who claims descent from the Quaker, from the Quaker colony who were here. The name, some of the names still being run in the parish until the mid 1800s. Late 1800s. The Quakers went and Medlicott had a problem. He never came here, as far as I can find, he never set foot in his presumed estate. He had a job in Dublin that entailed six days to work every week, and he had an estate in England. But he needed somebody to make a go of this place. And then the third character enters the stage. That man was James Moore. James Moore, as I say, rose from obscurity. As far as I'm concerned, I can't find, I suspect County Kildare is the origin. But he worked in the revenue service, and the revenue service employed people if you entered the revenue service, you were employed at a low grade, but if you had sufficient backing by important people, you rose very quickly. You, you, you all heard of people at the top of big organizations and they say how they, they worked in the mail room and they worked every part of the organization. They never told you that they worked for just one week and uh, six months after entry, they were deputy managing director. But it was the same in the revenue service. Every, Entrant had to work his way up. It may not be very long in each job. Moore um, was in Dublin, in Rings End, in the revenue service, and uh, working his way up. And suddenly he got a great impetus. Mr. Medlicott was appointed 
and Moore had support from another commissioner, but Medlicott became his supporter within a week of arriving in Dublin. And the reason for that was that Moore was married to Medlicott's niece. Now, the way to get on in business, I was told when I was young, was to marry the boss's daughter. <laughs> but uh, next best thing, I suppose, is to marry the boss's niece. And Moore moved up the ladder fairly quickly. He was collector of Trim. He was there for two months as collector of Trim, and he was suddenly moved. Because the man here in Ennis, Barrington, was moved to Ennis in County Clare. The man in Ennis was sacked. There was a vacancy in Ennis, and the move, the move was moved into town. So Medlicott now had, he had a relative looking after his affairs here. But he would have a relative who had a government job and wouldn't be pushing too hard for payment from him. He was the collector of customs and excise. James Moore was here. Now I can't find out where James Moore lived. And um, different uh, speculation has occurred as to places. There's a map in one of the pieces, but um, it's a copy of a map from the Medlicott estate, but it doesn't tell us anything more. It says he lived somewhere near the river. That's about the only, not certain which side even, of the river he lived. Moore came here in 1729 from Trim. And as I say, it eased the pressure on Medlicott for money because Moore had a job already. Yeah, he lived, but he was appointed agent he was already the collector of customs and excise. Now Moore was a man who looked after his own affairs very well. He, Mr. Joe McDermott has published pieces that goes into minute detail about Moore's activities. And each year he produced his statement of account and praise be almighty God, I am this day worth. He was worth usually about 1,500 pounds more than the year before. In fact, his account, his papers are in Dublin, uh, the James Moore papers, all available. He set out the money he spent uh, to charity so much. Horse racing in Castle Bar, excuse me, Brafey, he went to horse racing. He spent money on the lottery. He lost one year 25 pounds on the, on the lottery. He, uh, he, when his wife went to Dublin for Christmas, that cost him eight pounds. And uh, I don't know whether that was generous or otherwise. But Moore was here developing his own affairs. He didn't worry too much about the customs and excise. He did what was necessary to keep himself in good standing with the people in Dublin. There's very little accounts of seizures of smuggling. And Peter has written on the O'Donnells later on that they, they were notorious for smuggling with their ship Perry Weck from the Isle of Man to the west of Ireland. But smuggling was a national occupation in the west of Ireland. There were so many places you could in the Denton coast. And Moore's area covered Ballastadere Bay to the, the Killery. So imagine all the little places you could you been there with a load of brandy and so on and so on. Um, just go back to Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt paid off his creditors, his private creditors. He paid off the government. He didn't have the wherewithal to pay them off. And because he paid off his private creditors, he wasn't ostracized in any way. He set up another business, glass bottles or something like that. And uh, lived to, for another 20 years. His wife, Monoretta Brooks, had separated from I'm just going back now, backtracking on Pratt before we leave him, man for whom I have sympathy. Two years before he went bankrupt, his two sons were drowned in the Phoenix Park. He had three children, a daughter and two sons. His wife and himself separated about 1725. She was supposed to be eccentric in some way. She had noticed that when she was dying, 
her body was to be burned so not to be a danger to her neighbours. The woman before her time in cremation. And um, Pratt moved off the scene, but lived uh, as a respectable individual. Even though he still owed money to the government, that didn't matter, he paid off the private people. So you have a scene where Newport is in the hands of James Moore. Medlicott doesn't get involved. All he wants is the rent. Moore looks after the revenue service, but he couldn't possibly handle it with the staff he had. He dealt with the um, customs of excise. He dealt with the agers who walked around the, from one silly place to another, trying to calculate the amount of duty paid on local distilled spirits, butching and, well, call it whiskey, since they were all legal at the time, as long as you paid the duty on them, there were no standards on it. So, Medlicott was in London, 1835, Medlicott died, and his son, John Thomas, took over. And he was as inept as his father, or maybe he was not inept, maybe he had a lack of interest. He certainly had a lack of capital, in very little interest, but he is alleged or said to have come to Newport and lived in Newport. Eventually he went to uh, Waterford, the Rockets Castle, but the estate continued here, that looked like the estate continued. John Thomas had to be bailed out by James Moore, who was technically his employee, and uh, uh, one of the Longford people from Edwardstown, they ran the estate for three years and he got back on his feet. Money was a problem for Medlicots. They had no money to invest. They lived away from the place. Now, I say that because Medlicots were absentees, and the people up the road, Browns, were living there, while all this was going on, young John Brown was in Oxford. He came back, he developed a new town. He invested, young in his travels around Ireland, and I'm skipping now, in his travels around Ireland, spoke about the improvements that Browns were making in Westport, using kelp, using limestone, how they were improving their land, how they were improving the stock, how they were improving the numbers of stock held on their land. There was no such report from Newport. Nothing about what James Moore was doing. James Moore was allowing the town to evolve, to develop in its own rate. He, he did what kept himself in with the Medlicons, he didn't offend the revenue commissioners, and he looked after James Moore. He had land out in Barry Lahan, which he for his own private use. He rented land in Lahara as well. He uh, kept very precise accounts of his own affairs. So I believe that Newport would have held on to his place as the premier sea seaport in Mayo if it weren't for the Medlicots as absent. We were all taught about absentee landlords when we were in school and the, the terrible results from absentee landlords. The classic example was the contrast with the Browns of Westport who were there whatever anyone says about them, who <laughs> were there all the time. And the Medlicots who never had any very interest in this. In fact, John Thomas, the son, he built a place in Rockets Castle in Waterford. And uh, as I say, very little interest in Newport as such. Uh, I'm thrilled is the word that there's a celebration of the 300th anniversary coming up. You have a lot to celebrate in the town. You have documentary evidence. As I said, the indenture there is a waste of time trying to read it, but it is available. 
I unfolded it and I felt maybe I was unfolding it for the first time in 300 years. It's some parchment and you feel it's going to crack any minute when you open it out. So I was afraid to copy it myself. I asked the, the people in the library to do so for me and that's the best they could do. <coughs> it's very difficult to read. But the fact is, it sets out all the conditions. This, the, you might say the specification. There's no plan. But the specification for the town of Newport is set out in that document. It's, as I said to somebody earlier tonight, <coughs> most of us have baptismal certificates and birth certificates. Very few of us have a conception certificate. And Newport has a conception <coughs> certificate. The concept of Newport town is set out in that document. Houses, 20 houses, near or convenient to Ballybohan Bridge. That's the name of it, Ballybohan Bridge. <coughs> At Ballybohan Bridge, you ask yourself, why, why Medlicott wanted something here? Why? There was nothing here. There was a bridge. That was the only structure. There may have been a few huts. There was a bridge here. It was part of the road to to um, Tirolli, to Belmullet. Pocock in 1852 talks about a journey. Bishop Pocock came on various tours of Ireland. He talks about a journey where the horses sunk to their bellies going, and it took me three days to get to Belmullet, to the Bingham Estate. Now another thing I'll say about Newport, mentioning the Bingham Estate, in the early days after the, the um, Orange versus Stuart Wars, the 1690s. There were two places in Mayo that were put there for the purpose of increasing the Protestant influence. One was Benmullet and the other was Belmullet. The Binghams came to Belmullet. And the purpose in those two places was to increase the Protestant influence. There was a wholesale takeover in Belmullet. And there was a lot of opposition because there was hopping of cattle and killing of cattle by the, <coughs> the normal resident population because these intruders came in. There was nothing similar in Newport. Newport was, he was born on the prospect of profit. Somebody was going to make money out of it. Pratt thought he could make money out of it, but he made the mistake of investing short-term money in a long-term project. You don't do that. He <coughs> learned his lesson. Medlicott didn't have the money to invest in, in the town, and it was allowed to evolve. It could still be a very important town only for the landlord, Medlicott. Now, I shouldn't criticize Medlicott too much, because when I was um, studying, or when I finished studying, I tried to find out some of the descendants of these people. Uh, James Moore had five daughters. One of them, she was called Dorcas. I used to think that, because he referred to her in his letters as Darky, I used to think he spoke Irish. Dorcas and Darky, or Phyllis. And uh, until somebody told me that uh, Dorcas is a very sound biblical name and uh, the Dorcas appears quite early in the New Testament. One of his daughters married uh, the junior member of the Brown family in Westport. Their daughter married into Castle McGarrett and uh, the only descendant I could find was Garrett Brown. Unfortunately Garrett Brown died before, <coughs> almost two years ago in, in local law before I could, could uh, make contact with them. Um, another of his daughters married a Presbyterian clergyman in, in uh, Belfast. I haven't been able to find anything on that. But lately, I came across one of the Medlicots, a descendant of the Medlicots. And that man, when I told him that you were proposing to celebrate, in fact, he wanted to be here tonight, but he had another local history talk in his own place in, in uh, Newtown Mount Kennedy in Wicklow. He would love to come and he said maybe maybe they wouldn't want the descendant of a landlord. <laughs> <laughs> and the descendant of a landlord coming to the celebration I said 
There's no evidence that your ancestor ever did anything in Tom Good or had. So <laughs> 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 I'm sure that you, know, you, could, you could get by without, without any harm coming to you. So he, he wants to book a place to, to attend. He's John Levercutt. He has some sheep in the Wicklow Mountains and he was a teacher in Dublin. He, he was in Rockets Castle. He's, he knows all the history of the Medlicots, so his pedigree is up there in um, Irish landed gentry and it was the English one as well. All descended so and so so and so, so, so I think it's the uh, tenth great grandson of Thomas Medlicott. But I've come across another one on the internet, I can't find his address anymore. He um, was anxious to know about the town as well. Medlicott, so if they turn up, I hope nobody stones him. <laughs> um, what else is there? Um, the, the thing. Yeah, that's the, he's the ninth great grandson of Thomas Medlicott, who was here in town. Now, Why, why you might say that Medlicott wanted a town? He had an estate, he never worried about it before. Why did Pratt want to take a chance? The reason is that at that time, after the Battle of the Boyne siege in Limerick and this, all that trouble that went on, uh, the Anglo-Irish, so-called gentry as they were, they felt it was time to put down roots in Ireland and they started building houses and enclosing domains and so on. And I believe that Pratt, that Pratt wanted to uh, establish himself somewhere. And this was his last chance they, that he could establish a place in Newport, a bit like the Browns of Westport were doing, built a big house, had a domain around it, an estate, and uh, I believe that was Pratt's ambition. Unfortunately, <coughs> wrong thing. But if it hadn't gone wrong for Pratt, we would have a more, the uh, town of Newport, as I say, would be raised with a lot of other big towns, well, I'm sure it raised with a lot of big towns anyway, but it would um, be the major port in County Mayo. Just so many things went wrong. Medlicott said no money, Pat gambled and lost. But, um, by the way, has anybody any questions on what I've said so far? Yeah. I just want to tell you that Johnny Medlicott is an old colleague of mine. I'm delighted to hear that. Yeah. I yeah. haven't seen him since nearly 1970s. So <laughs> I'll be inviting him up to the house. Do. Do. If you could give me a telephone number, yeah? I will. I will. Thank you. I'll, I'll give you a telephone number. And I promise not he, to stone him. He was at a. I won't, a, I won't stone him. <laughs> Very stoning. nice man. I'm talking about stoning him. Have the uh, museum deciphered that document? Pardon? Have the museum deciphered the document? Oh yeah, in fact, yeah. if you work on the document, you can decipher it. That bit there, it's it's slow work. Mm. You, it's three hundred years old, but it's slow work. I, and uh, I'm sure I could decipher it, but it's I I had to decipher a lot of it, in fact, because I had to put in my thesis, and uh, I had to quote word for word. Oh, it's easily, but it's not easy. I, I reckon that a week can get that done. Oh, I'd love to. It's, it's, uh, it's not indecipherable. You, after a while, you get used to the, the uh, letters, you get used to the script, and of course it was an indenture because what we have here is Medlicott's half. That was cut across. The, the other half belonged to Pratt, and we don't know where that went. But this, is, this one was signed I'll try and bring something up. 
Do you have to actually call the town Newport, or when did the name Newport arise? Sorry? Did, did the deed mention the words Newport as the name of the town, or was that yes, a later Yes, in the point? very beginning, 